starting from the premise that experience is a costly teacher, often misleading and sometimes played wrong, but I think the analysis of experiences will always provide fruitful results, even if they're not conclusive. I'd like to talk about uh, the Aragalia, the, the so-called people's struggle, in terms of what I identify as three or possibly four turning points and four phases. So I'd like to to begin by by showing you some. I can't show you some of the stuff that's here because it doesn't uh, translate possibly. But if you bear with me, and I, I must say that some of the videos that I present are of a violent nature, so I apologize for that. And if you don't want to see them, fine, you don't. But I think we need a background. Let me first explain. So round about in the first phase, which is from about the 9th of April to about the 9th of May. The 9th is very important. The 9th is where we, and I'm hoping that in the discussion we can talk about the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, which is the 9th of November. And I hope that something will happen by then. Don't forget that, uh, that old Napoleon was Louis' uncle, just as J.R. Jayawardner was Rajapaksa's uncle. Huh? There are many many parallels to be to be seen. But anyway, so the first phase, I think this video captures some of it. Protests at Gotago Gama opposite the President's office in Palermo had been running peacefully for the past 31 days. Young people who were among those involved in the demonstration or in the struggle out of love and the Earlier today, a group of thugs broke into the protest area Breaching security, provoking unrest. They set fire to the tents. Set... Key to that was it was going peacefully for the first month, and what you're seeing now are actually government goons, including government ministers who still remain in power, spearheading an attack. So when you see people with poles and sticks, they are there with the under the auspices, as it were, of the current government, the former. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa, who is the elder brother of the President who was being ousted. And you'll see how they are being treated by the military as opposed to how the military treats others later on. Okay. ...by protesters and vandalized and structures set up by them. So it's like the police is coordinating this. Thousands of peaceful protesters, protesters are being attacked by the by these goons who actually walked from the Prime Minister's official residence to this place. They walked after having a meeting with the Prime Minister. And the, the military and the people, the police that were checking it were waiting to see what would happen. This is a crucial point because from being completely non-violent as was said, you then have waves of counter-violence and counter-counter-violence and so on, which I think were extremely damaging, but you can understand what happened because you had a group of people who were the mercy of these mercenaries and these thugs, and then some of them retaliated, and that retaliation became uh, quite terrible, actually. Water cannon and tear gas in order to prevent the 
retaliation by those who were hit. So they waited till one group hit another group, and then they intervened after that. The actual drugs were brought from the Prime Minister's office that did all this attacking. He says, this is the work of the Prime Minister, he's, he's bringing thugs and goons to hit us. Don't be misled by the picture. This is the Buddhist monk on the government side who is physically trying to prevent the water cannon from being uh, presented against the mercenaries, against the goons. So there are Buddhist monks on both sides. The situation was brought under control only after a few hours. Members of the Eka University Students Federation were among several others who joined the demonstration today. The chief of army personnel led by Major General have been dispatched to the area for security, but tensions persisted for a few hours. Protesters at Gota Goga took steps to protect unarmed. That is what it's the movement is called Gota Go Home. Gota is the name of the, of the uh, president, Gota Beraj Paksa. So that's the strength and its weakness, the fact that it was targeting an individual as opposed to a system. This is the leader of the, the People's Liberation Party, our closest to the, to, to the kinds of left parties that you have. They were involved in two rebellions, two uh, attempted rebellions, 71 and 89. So um, the parties came and I think I'm going to stop this. So that's the first phase. The first phase was over when the non-violent part was over because then there was retaliation, there was burning of houses including the house of the, of the then Prime Minister who was now the President and attacks. Five people were killed of course, violence, counter-violence. But this is the kind of a violence that took place uh, around that time with complete impunity in the sense that there was So, one of the things, so that's the, the, the phase was, this is the government people attacking this person. And in the video that I have, I can't show you, the police guy comes along and sort of says, please don't do this, and he, and he takes the, the person who's attacked away, you know. So, his hands are tied, obviously. And from there, we move to even greater acts of violence in the next phase. So the first phase was up to that point, up to the 9th of, of May. Then thereafter, about the 9th of July, as I said, the 9th is important, the, the people came, about 150,000 to 250,000 came. This despite fuel shortages, uh, there was no proper public transportation. It was a complete wave. There is some footage which I can probably show you. And there, what they did was, they literally took over the office of the president, his official residence. There is some really superb uh, video which 
unfortunately we this time so, but it is amazing he has this hallowed sacred place and six of them are sleeping on the president's bed they use his toilet to the show they use his swing pool so it was total and utter disrespect and disregard they trash the place for which now all of them are being accused and uh, imprisoned and all of that kind of stuff for that but what i'm trying to say is there was a kind of subaltern element to this it was not the pomp and the glory and so on of the place they just thought it was hilarious so they would take selfies in the pool and you know sit on his chair and they also found incidentally 18 million rupees worth of pocket money in one of the drawers but i must say they returned the money it was the police that uh, lost the money for for a while so you have a group of people young most of them completely idealistic in this but haven't a clue about how deep and how dense the situation is how complicated it is but that was what the the fresh wind was then the president he sort of left the country surreptitiously resigned and so on and then which led to the third phase the third phase the third turning point is Ranil Vikramasinghe becoming the the president first the prime minister mind you I know we have various forms of democracy but you have here a man who is head of the longest standing party in the country the United National Party which controlled the country from independence onwards it was I mean it was I mean a virtual virtual fait accompli that that party would get 40 percent of the vote whatever election even if a dead guy contested he would get 40 percent so this man moved from 40 percent of the vote in the last election they didn't win a single seat not one single seat but due to the national list they were allowed one place now as the person who lost the election from 40 percent of the vote to no seats at all he got himself appointed to that national list illegally he got himself appointed to that national list because he was not on the latin national list the national list is not meant for people who contest election and lose it's for a different group of people who then come in so it took him one year to get into parliament so a person who has only his vote from his party and from whom there was a breakaway a very large breakaway that scored about 30 odd seats from one seat in parliament his own out of 225 he becomes a prime minister and the president can you imagine popularly elected president from within the party because basically and I'll, i will come to that it's the uh, he's sort of doing the stooge work but before that i want to show you just one more the kind of violence that took place after he up people there are plenty of this stuff I don't want to shock you too much but to say that it moved from sort of little bits of violence to fairly concentrated attacks on individuals there's a video I can show you I was doing a lecture about two weeks ago at one of the universities just outside on the main road about 5,000 police and military to quell about a hundred students who were peacefully protesting so it's overkill the point i'm trying to make here is in most situations in this in this third phase in most situations you'd want as a government to try to reduce the optics as it were of the violence that you perpetrate you'd want to say okay we're doing it but we'll do it at night we'll do it on the sly and so on and i will show you the video that the day he was appointed as president he unleashed both the military and the paramilitary at night and there are some there is a video of that maybe I can show you and then I'll stop the video the Tavis and military government destroy everything they just completely decimate the whole thing and he's a man who two months ago said you know this aragale aragale means protest huh? it's a good thing we'll have a place for it and so on but of course you don't believe this guy because in brussels in 2017 he said we should abolish the prevention of terrorism act to the most draconian law that i know of then three months ago he said even though we may not abolish it we won't 
uh, we won't implement it. And now he's actually implemented against protesting students, calling them terrorists, and they are incarcerated now for 60 days or so. They have been taken to various sites in the night, blindfolded, and then hands tied and so on. In the, uh, with the view that I think, because we have a wonderful, bizarre but wonderful, horrible tradition in our country where, where criminals are taken in the night to uh, ostensibly to show their cash of arms or their drug deals and always they try to escape and always they are shot. This is their way of reducing the, the, the load in the prison, I guess. So you have these stories and we are accepted to believe it and magistrates believe it. As a person who was handcuffed, his legs in chains, they were taking him to this site where apparently he said he has stored some guns. He jumped out after hitting the two people in the vehicle and tried to swim and they had to shoot him while he was swimming. Now the magistrate with an open face is okay justifiable homicide because of uh, attempt to escape. So that's the climate we are in, where the violence is becoming more and more pronounced, more and more targeted. And the important thing in that is that it must be seen as gratuitous violence. Because if it is seen as minimal force, then you can push it. The idea is we don't care. So on the news, we have we have rules in the country you can't show people smoking or drinking but on the news you can show people hitting each other blood pouring you know all of that kind of stuff and it must be shown the violence must be excessive it must be gratuitous so you get the message we don't care what other people think we want to demonstrate just to what extent we will go right so now that's where i want to sort of formally begin and then now we have so the the last phase that we have now is the one where the Aragalia, this protest, is no longer dictating the terms of the conflict or the struggle or the opposition, but they are responding to A being arrested, B being, being attacked, C being threatened. I'm really sorry I can't show you, but now the latest ones are where little children are being arrested in the crowd. They're being actually caught and dragged. There's video here where a uh, little child with the mother, the mother is squeezed by about 10 police people and the child is being dragged away. And in parliament they are saying, you know, if you happen to be there with your children, this is what's going to happen to you. So it's, it has, you understand, it has to be gross and grotesque. It's not minimal. And I think this is a very new move. I mean, we've seen it in uh, Hitler's Germany, we've seen it in uh, Prabhakaran's uh, control in the, in, the, in the northern parts of Sri Lanka. Violence must be gratuitous, it must be excessive, and it must also be irrational. If you are attacked because you've done something wrong, it's easy to say, I'm not going to do anything wrong. But you act just because it's Monday today, or I feel like doing it, or you're the neighbor of somebody who has done something wrong, that's fear. You know, and uh, Goering said that very clearly when he said the only way to enslave people is to strike fear in this irrational kind of way, which is what they did. So now we have a situation where the protesters, now they're mainly, those who are left are mainly students, they're scared, families are scared, because they just disappeared. And if there are 10 of them, they will make sure that the 10 are arrested in 10 separate places. Then you don't know where, they, they play this musical chairs. You go to one police station, they're not there, they're in another one. Another one, and then of course they appear about six or eight hours, but utterly traumatized. They're targeting some of them, you know, they realize that this way is through examples. Okay, so I mean, let me now do a bit of analysis. So I'm, I'm, I would like to sort of start with, with Foucault. Alongside the use of force to subdue and terrorize, through exemplary punishment, we have these other elements of sovereign power. He says, I quote, on the one hand, the juridical aspect. Power uses obligations, oaths, commitments, and the law to bind. On the other hand, power has a magical function, role and, eff and efficacy. Power dazzles and power petrifies. This is what we are seeing. The power must be seen to dazzle, must be seen to be exorbitant, must be seen to be, and I think Foucault's great insight, I mean to quote Hammer, is 
the originality of Foucault's work lies in part in how he reverses the question of power, asking not how power is held and imposed, but how it is produced. What we're seeing now, and that's what I said, what we're seeing is how is power produced. Power is produced by this person through the various panoplies of things, who has absolutely no power in that legitimate sense to begin with. Somebody who lost his seat by a huge majority. In, in, a, in, in exceptional ways, and I will come to that. And who has managed to get into these places where he is now, he is now a president of country in which the executive presidency combines the American and the French uh, model. So it's supremely powerful. There's absolutely nothing that can be done to dislodge him. So you get to get to that, and then you have to then demonstrate this, right? So let me begin by. Quoting, and I think sort of bad descriptions are always the best descriptions. Here is a university academic, I've translated it, and this is what he says, because I think it's very instructive. He says, there are a host of excellent, he uses the Vishishta, there are a host of excellent features that I see in this people's struggle, the Aragali. They are being they are being independent of political parties. One, independence of political parties. Two, obtaining the leadership of the middle class. Three, not being racist. Four, not privileging any religion. In Sinhala, it's Agambadi. Right? Five, not being a leftist struggle. Six, being free and independent. Not having ulterior motives. Ensuring the participation of all groups of people. Ensuring the participation of all religious groups. Raising the unfettered voice of young people. Clearing the path to a new world that is not socialist. Challenging all political parties. Challenging fraud, fraud and corruption. Challenging officials who are corrupt and inefficient. Challenging the religious leaders who are controlled by politics. And finally, the most important, standing up on behalf of the Sri Lankan nationality and state. <coughs> so if you were to analyze those, so it's a... It's a it's a very widely held ideological thing. So let me backtrack one minute. So in Sri Lanka we have, I would say, four interlocking crises. Of which we only recognize the economic crisis as predominant and that is what led to the first phase. So the first phase, you had all the kind of classes involved because of the, the, the fuel queue, the lack of food, the rising inflation, all of that kind of stuff. So, you know. Then you have the political crisis, the fact that you have a, an executive presidency like this, you have a parliament of buffoons who are completely beholden to, to the president and his, uh, and his family, basically. I mean, that's a word we have, I think, in South Asia introduced into the English language. Family bandism. It's not yet in the OED, I think. But any family bandism means, as you can think, the whole family controls. We have a family. The former president was asked, by Al Jazeera, I think, he was asked, look, you've got 340 members of your family in various positions of power. What do you have to say about this? And his response is, if you can't do that, what's the point of being president? So the point is, that's a kind. Of, so we have that particular frame of reference. So within that, we have seen the political crisis because this, the former president was Uncannily stupid, uncanny. I mean, it was like unbelievably stupid. Now we have a guy who's not that stupid, who is who's cunning and so on, but he's doing the bidding of the family. I will, I will come to that. So we, we then have, as, as you can see, the political and the economic. The social crisis we're not engaging with. And least of all, the ideological crisis. So that is why what looked like a very successful social movement, public movement, which galvanized half the country, fizzled out when the immediate economic needs were sort of sorted out piecemeal. So you can get fuel without having to wait for three days or four days. The middle class felt, why the hell should we be standing in the queue? The poor can do that. But you know, it's a waste of our time. So the middle class has dissociated themselves from this. And of course, the social one and uh, and the ideological, the social, because we still 
think of Sri Lanka as a singular Buddhist country, right? In other words, that the stones are singular Buddhist, and the rocks are singular Buddhist, and the buildings are singular Buddhist, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So we still think of this as a southern issue. The fact that these shortages and the militarization affected Tamils in the north and the east for 30 years is something we are only discovering now and still like, okay, but they're Tamils, you know. So, so there is this huge problem and of course the ideological one. The ideological one, as we can see, and I'm going to discuss that in a bit of detail, is I think the more dangerous one. We have, as you see, clearly inroads and and attacks on human rights, basic rights, but over and above that, I think you'll have the problem of 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 the neoliberal agenda which this new guy Rajapaksa is going to bring in. So to look at the earlier thing, so we have the powerful voice is raised by those things that the professor said, challenging fraud and corruption, that <coughs> continues, right? Challenging officials who are corrupt and inefficient, those two continue from that list of 10 or so that I said. Improvements that have been seen during the struggle, that is from the 9th of April up to now, is not being racist. They began by being single majoritarian, urban, middle and, you know, but towards the end we were able to actually move there with people who represented those who had disappeared in the war, people, you know, there was a pride um, rally there, there were a number of other things, so they actually moved. We had a monk who came and said, hey, you're now, you're being terrorist and supporting the terrorists when you fight about this, but we sat down, explained to him, and he was okay. So that okayness is not there in the broader society. I must say, it's not even there in the university. So this struggle, which started off, as I said, urban, middle class, improved in terms of racism, not privileging any religion. You'll notice, unfortunately, I can't show you, but monks and priests together, holding hands and doing, doing work, very good. Still, you can see a slight, you know, deference to the Buddhist monk, but nonetheless, far better than anywhere else in the country. Ensuring the participation of all groups of people. You know, we had people from the north coming and I thought that was really important because they don't feel these issues in that way. It was an expression of solidarity. Some people from the from the, uh, the Malay area, the, uh, the plantation areas also came. So it was developing. It was at that stage when it was developing really into a movement that was more inclusive and so on that the violence hit it and then the counter violence you had groups of people who just went and attacked politicians houses and i must say i'm not romanticizing this at all right but a good 50 percent of those attacks were not done by this group some of it was but of course that's aggregates of other other kinds of things so participation of all religious groups and the unfettered voice of the young people, the students, all those, those four were, actually five were improving. There was a great deal of improvement, much better than the rest of the country, including academia, including intellectuals. So here was, there was a little library that they made in the, in the middle of this place, and they would have discussions. Some of us would go and talk to them about these issues, some of them esoteric, some of them they'd argue about, you know. And there was also a sense of complete anarchy. There was this one group would do something, the other group would do something else. But of course, anarchy doesn't last very long. What happens is divided on party lines. So there are two main parties now that are engaged in a struggle for control of this protest movement, which is one of the reasons. And you have the maverick guys who have little groups on claves there. So it's a very complex situation now. But and then regression, the regression is, as I said, of the four things. So I, his list is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about 12, of which the regression was being independent of political parties. He said that they're no longer independent of political parties. There are two. There is that JVP, which is the National Liberation Front, and a break away from that group. They are at loggerheads. And it's, it's about when should you have elections? Should you have elections immediately? Or should we have it them in 60 years when we can get our act together? I'm exaggerating only a bit, but there's a, the, the, the student, Indian University Student Federation has a very thin, small group of university students, very active, very radical, but no basis on the ground. So naturally the road election. The other party, the National Liberation, is thinking of becoming a middle class party. They want to graduate from being, a, you know, the former 
uh, terrorist group to being a, a middle class party so that's the tension you have there so independence and of course then you have this former general and people who have their little little enclaves their little groups so it's hopelessly divided now they can do nothing without fighting with artists the artists also divided that's what happens when you attack them so you attack one artist thank goodness the middle class has fled this one because they're completely unreliable and they were there for what they could get it was quite uh, hilarious and sad you're mar marching in protest and we had this thing the 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 president's brother the youngest brother is a nitwit but he is he's one of the few people i know who does not have a first language so he can't speak in any language fluently and so he was asked to explain something and he, he just so anyway to cut a long story short there's a little horn slogan that we do to remind us of this man's faux pas you know so you know you had bmws and mercs and uh, you know range rovers doing this horning thing cup to car 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 to support now nothing now they stare at you because they're completely out of this they no longer see the queues are okay we got some things are sorted out we are on the way ranil is our guy you know as somebody told me ranil vikramasinghe is is uh, able to enjoy good wine and loves his classical music now for any self respecting um, upper middle class ngo activist that's i mean that's better than if you said he was a card carrying marxist or something you know so that's the the kind of thing the shift challenging the political parties also no more now they working we trying to work with the political parties challenging the religious leaders no so we've lost on all those focuses the independence the dynamism i don't know how long it will last but that has now got curtailed and they are in little groups now working with the parties then the widely held middle and upper class conservative position that is ideologically founded there are many of those three of them not being a lefty struggle now that's why they wanted because you know they want a lefty struggle because it means queues it means something else with all that of course i don't agree then clearing the path to a new world that is not socialist that's the dangerous one because that's ranil vikramasinghe's great thing he believes in nothing except the new liberal kind of market uh, thing and we'll talk about that right then standing on behalf of the sri lankan nationality and state so those are the three most problematic things which the middle class wants they want a sri lankan state which is nominally uh, plural but in which singhala buddhist hegemony reigns supreme they want a sri lankan state in which there's a new liberal ethos is what uh, is what is there and the new liberal remember it's completely uh, unacceptable to the majority of the sri lankans because we have an extraordinary um, resilient free education and free health system which is the only reason many of us are where we are it's unique even in south asia so you can you can become a doctor or an engineer or not to be the university professor in the humanities without being a first generation student where your parents are wage earners daily wage earners because everything is free you will get a stipend now that's going to be rolled because as you know the neoliberal ethos is education is investment health is an investment as i tell people if health is an investment nobody is going to invest in my health because i am you know dead in the water and nobody is going to invest in the education of somebody who is very poor because the returns are less so the move from rights to that is what is being characterized here so anyway those are the sad so that's the checklist if you look at it the fraud and corruption stuff is still maintained and that i think has raised the bar a bit except and i'll come to that the the sort of improvements in trying to be more inclusive and so on the negatives are when these corrupt political parties have now got their hands on this and of course the ideological things are the ones that are actually pushing the middle class to get out of it all right so there we have this problem the middle class and we must be united we must forget our differences that's what they said at the time but as you know any struggle that is worth its salt actually leads to the loss of privilege and power of certain groups of people those who are entrenched with that so it's never this win win nonsense is not there so unity is at a cost 
And it is at the cost of ignoring all of these structural issues, presuming it's an accident about you know some false policy here or something else there that you know if the port city and the and the Hamadja report and this silly little column that they made for the Rajapaksa if that was not done it would, no it's a principle Do, is the development that we want in the country that provides equity and justice and parity is that going to be achieved by having a port city where like Macau or some place where you have you know gambling and various other kinds of things not the moral argument but where is that going to percolate down to the the farmer the peasant the, the industrial worker and so on it's not it's a different kind of development and with of course huge benefits thrown in right so now why is it that Rajapaksa is important in this right. let me see this first the Rajapaksa, unlike, uh, unlike the Vikrama Singh, the Rajapaksa, Rajapaksa they, were, they were around for a long time. It's a big political family and some people actually liked the former president. Because he was nationalist, he was Buddhist, he was very in-your-face Buddhist, you know. And he sort of, but Ranil Vikrama Singh, the new president, is roundly disliked by everybody. So why is he there? He's there to perform a contract. So. He's a lapdog, that's why he's there. And he's there, his only value to the 225 members of parliament and there is the promise of security. Right? Security in three forms. From a justifiably enraged public represented by this struggle. From prosecution for corruption, and that's huge, and violence. And from having an election before the next two and a half or 25 and a half years if they can manage it. So the point is, that's his task. Since nobody likes him, if he doesn't deliver that, he's out on his behind. So the, the point there is, so protection there in that sense, that security, can only be given by repressing dissent, by militarization, and by this sort of uh, claim to stability and security. And you'll be amazed at how many times people talk about stability and security as if it were a value in and of itself, a fundamental value. But of course the question is stability for whom? Security for whom? The security and stability he will provide is for the corrupt elements and their families and so on who have ditched this. So protection means the protection of the status quo, that's the 225, and the Rajapaksa family which is more than 225. Right? and his friends and that has to be done by brutally repressing dissent and protest and the operative word is brutally not apologetically not accidentally not if you can prevent it it has to be in excess I would say in excess you see so the 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 the, the I think it is Tartaka who said a threat is greater than its execution so the threat of huge violence must be there once you do it, then you are subject to it, you are on the run, you are on the run, but here, so. So unbridled militarization, including paramilitary groups and extrajudicial methods of deniability. I mean, it's amazing. In the, in the first protests, when this again, the move was to try to make this violent in that overt way. So there was a move against the president, they, they cordoned off, this was very early, uh, I think in... Uh, in March, early April, they got one of his residence. The paramilitary guys got somebody to come in and burn a bus. It didn't work. And so they f there was video footage of this guy burning the bus. They couldn't find him. But they found all kinds of other people. They found all sorts of people based on photographs. So finally they found him. And they found him because others are reported. He's from a paramilitary agency which was run by the best friend or one of the best friends of the president called, um, what is it? Avangad. Avangad, the other one, Rakhna Lanka. All right? he was from, so anyway, so now he's accused and the case is going on. Five military people, including three brigadiers, go and claim that he is one of us and he was really doing a good thing and please don't prosecute him. So you can see, there is no shame, there is none of that kind of stuff, it's quite overt and open. 
So these, so the paramilitary is there. And on the 21st night, 22nd of July, the day the president, the new president took office, the people who went in and destroyed that, I showed you the aerial photograph, were military and paramilitary. They go together. It's only when they go back to the bus, they change and they go their separate ways, but military and paramilitary. Not accountable to anybody. So I think that's the important thing. So, so the, it is necessary to establish his value to the people. Vikram Singh has to show his value, but otherwise nobody, as I said, I repeat it. Huh? And nausea, nobody likes it. So he has very little in common with them. Imagine the, the NGO circuit would like wine and, and, uh, and classical music, but not the ordinary, not even the ordinary politician. These are people who hated him. So he has to deliver and deliver every day all the time. So now he has issued an open threat. So anybody who he thinks were, was involved in this can be attacked. Now the latest is their, their exit permits, are, they, they're not allowed to leave the country. There are indefinite cases going on and on. At the same time, that all cases that against the president and the former president is people have been removed. All automatically removed. So what I'm trying to say is, you don't have even a Mickey Mouse judiciary. You have one in which all of the arms of the state, the state become the arms of the government. So the Attorney General's function is to protect the government. He has nothing to do with the state and so on with the others, the military and police. So stability and security is from a passive citizenry cowed by fear of reprisal. The ideal of the Suranil Vikram Singh method is to go back to business as usual before the protest movement and to go back to client, client patron systems of politics. We have, you know, we have politics in capitalism that is based not on, on any, any meritocracy but on uh, patron client relationships. So the, the, the agenda then is for him to do the bidding of the Rajapaksas, the bidding of the clan, plus two things. One is his personal vendetta. So anybody he doesn't like, you know, I'll give you examples. There was somebody who crossed him 15 years ago, he had him arrested for doing something. With him. I mean, that guy should have been arrested for being an idiot, but he wasn't. He was arrested for doing something 15 years ago to this man. And the other, of course, is the neoliberal thing, which is frightening, I think, because, you know, imagine a country that has come out of 30 years of civil war, in which the so-called old PQLI indicators, the quality of life indicators, are not as bad as they should have been. Because of the welfare, the solid welfare structure for education we have. Of course, I'm, I'm not saying it was it's perfect, there are lots of issues, but the point is, if you dismantle that in a situation where 7 million uh, people, which is the third, are according to the UN, in facing severe food shortage. If you remove those kinds of subsidies and you, you change it to little cosmetic kinds of packages and deals rather than institutional monthly welfare measures, you we are the fifth I, or, or sixth, I think, most heavily malnourished country in the world from being one that was middle income. And now the government says, the cabinet says, we are no longer middle income. We have decided as a strategic move that we will become low income in order to get more aid. So that's the kind of nonsensical regime we are in. So basically, what we have then is a situation which is pretty dire because all decent or civilized checks and balances have been removed and openly so. The judiciary just gives decisions whatever is required. Now, the latest is the government is introducing a rehabilitation center bill. Which means, and they say, dissidents, protesters, you know, people who are misguided, drug addicts will be taken and rehabilitated. Including shock treatment and various other kinds of things. So they're just, just trying it. You know, the other day, last week, uh, 10 days ago, the government declared under the official secrets act, mind you, which itself is bizarre, that they declared large parts, large swathes of the country, of the capital, out of bounds, under the Official Secrets Act. And so they attacked people for walking on the street in that direction. 
So you can see, and of course the terrible thing is our neighbours, the people around us are only interested, I mean, I guess justifiably, in economic and political deals. So we have we have to deal and wheel, and of course, you know, the I think you also experienced that a bit, the, the Chinese turn. So we have a very serious Chinese turn here. And the Chinese are quite justifiably unwilling to to um, to sort of renegotiate their interest rates and various things because they've already paid the money up front. They have paid $150 million to the president and various other people. So why would they want to renegotiate? How would they renegotiate? If that part is also renegotiable, they do. So basically, you have a situation where the economy is in tatters. The country requires, depending on on how you do it, uh, either 59 billion or 30, 30 to 59 billion in debt. And interestingly, China has about 10% of that, Japan has about 10% of that, the ADB has about 13%, but about 55% is from international sovereign bonds. And as you know, when the country was in dire straits in January, they decided to pay 500 million because international sovereign bonds are, bonds are friends who have already paid commissions and various other kinds of things. So BlackRock has a huge amount of money. So does that uh, St. Kitts and Nevis place. So what, what we're seeing is huge debt and the, the response of the debt is going to be the increase in sort of IMF kinds of things. We have increases in indirect taxes, which again affect the, the middle poor, the poor, the middle class. Direct taxes, the increases are, 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 are capped at 36% in the new proposals. Whether you earn 10 million or, or what is it, 400,000, it's 36%. So it's again back to that kind of thing, helping each other, the whole neoliberal kind of thing, the rich are actually a boon to society and uh, they make various kinds of contributions. To summarize before I, I finish, it's so basically we have a situation where the Araga layer, the protest movement came yay close to achieving something lasting and they settled for something which was, and I think uh, and I probably, something that was not quite legitimate, the idea that you want an individual to leave, right, because he's no longer has a mandate. The question of mandate and stuff is very complicated. 6.9 million percent, uh, 6.9 million voters, about nearly 55 percent voted for him, nearly 60 percent voted for him. They clearly don't want him anymore and the parliament was elected by a landslide on the basis of his victory. So they are also not legitimate but of course the numbers are not clear. I mean you need a new election but nobody wants a new election because many of them can't even go back to the electorates because they are not accepted, they are completely... So basically, the Aragala itself raises some interesting issues. One is the people, who are the people? Now, if we go the numbers game, many of them say, oh, this struggle has fizzled out, there are not many people, but I think it has filtered itself. The people are diverse, their interests are diverse, their, their aspirations are diverse, their, their understanding is diverse. So the middle class is clearly left, there is no question about it. They are throwing in their lot with, with the Raj, Rajapaksa, what I call the Vikramasinghas Rajapaksa government. Because Vikramasinghe has his own stuff, particularly the neoliberal stuff, but he's also doing the bidding of this by providing them that kind of thing. So the question of ideology, the mainstream triumphalism, the, the nationalism, all of that kind of stuff, needs to be confronted. So we need to look at that because it's only through a struggle that that can be refined and we saw that the first you know 50-60 days the, the people's movement was as entrenched in the single majoritarianism before but it moved as I said it moved significantly to take positions that were more than liberal that, that were more than liberal they were always contested but Everybody has a right to talk. Right now you don't have, if you're Muslim in the country, you don't have a right to talk. You'll be arrested under various things. Interestingly, they make many of the arrests under the ICCPR Act. So they, they use the ICCPR Act in Sri Lanka to curb any kind of dissent, particularly minority-based dissent. So the core issue of representative democracy within the Sri Lankan constitution is fundamental in this because they are utterly corrupt. 
<coughs> there is a correlation between the amount of money they spend officially, and of course unofficially, and the amount of votes they get. The whole entrenched party structure is utterly futile, utterly futile. There is no, of course, I'm telling the Nepalis this, of course, it's as futile as yours is. Right? So then you look at the nature of the state and its co-institutions. There is no de facto separation of power at all. And even devolution is just another excuse for a family member to take on a position somewhere else. So you have in the in the Pradesh Sabha, the smallest unit, you have probably the near duel cousin. Then in the in the district or the the, the the provincial council, you have the second son or the son-in-law. Then you have in parliament the father and a son, maybe. You know, so that's so what devolution is that? So the, the, these are the kinds of issues. But we do have a shift from active, from passive to active citizenship. And I think that's important. We elected people once every four years or five years or six years and then forgot about it. And then the people the people who elected said we have a mandate for this and a mandate for that and a mandate for whatever they wanted, which was basically nothing. So I think we now have a move, if you want to know what is what I see is coming, because the attacks are continuing. There are videos of what happened, as I said, children being attacked, they are being hounded, really hounded, and they are combining with all kinds of other attacks on the university system, on academics, on dissent, and of course the economic situation is really, really dire. We have, for the first time in our country since independence, starvation. Of course, I say that with an argument because in the Northern East during the war there were situations as bad as that, but this is across the board and with no, no end in sight. So we have that. So I think the move has to be now from a social movement which is broad to, to fairly well thought out and structured civic disobedience. You have to move to civic disobedience, but which is non-violent, which does not allow them the, the option to claim that violence. Because the middle class claims, oh, the Aragali, the people's movement became violent, therefore we, we got out of it. But actually, as we can see, it was both provoked and internally manipulated to do that. So the challenge is to, to engage in civic disobedience in a situation where the Sri Lankan regime it's not going to play by the book like the British did. So you're going to have huge repercussion, but then that seems to be the only response because you're going to get no joy from a system that, as I said, is designed on those three types of security to prevent any kind of proper representation. You don't have the benefit of a constitution that can do that. I mean, the same group, let me tell you this, the same group of about 150 people voted to uh, to increase the powers of the president. The same group voted in the next amendment to decrease the powers of the president. Then again they voted the next time round to increase the powers of the president. Now they're thinking about decreasing the powers again. But with all so the thing is it doesn't matter what it is, they're there they are for what they can get. And there they are to entrench. I would say I'll leave with this one point. I think there are a number of people who have talked about it. I'm getting very vocal. I see in, I don't dare, don't dare say South Asia, but certainly in Sri Lanka, politicians are now an emerging class. That's why I wanted to start with the 18th Brumaire. They think like a class. They behave like a class. It's emerging. So what is of most paramount interest for them is their class interest. For example, increase of their pensions, you know, various kinds of things. They have a huge battle in parliament, which you can see. And then behind the scenes, they all have tea together in the parliamentary canteen, which costs like literally a million rupees a day. So in a, in a bankrupt country. So when the politicians act like a class, their differences are subordinate to those class interests. And so you have then the issue that if the politicians are clearly behaving like a class, an emerging kind of nascent, small subclass, and if you have the constitution which is completely useless, if you have the judiciary which is a lackey of the, of the regime and does not even think of the state, and appointments are entirely like that, you have a bureaucracy that is three parts corrupt and six parts inefficient. 
then what is it that you do? It is the, the issue then is for a kind of thing that makes business as usual impossible. So you snatched defeat because we wanted, we opted for the removal of the president, not the presidency, which would be much more, much harder. But of course, that means a longer thing. And the president is re is replaced by somebody who's about 12 times worse. And who's implementing an economic policy, political economic policy of neoliberalism, the damage of which would be catastrophic for what we have understood as the Sri Lankan way. Thank you.